windmills, quaint old towns, and tulips, the Holland of picture books. I know another Holland. My name is Backer, Sam Backer, engineer with the Netherlands Water Ministry. My job to fight the sea, to protect the old land, and to make new land. As my father did, as my son will do. Look at our country, a small flat shelf on the northwestern edge of Europe a quarter the size of the state of New York, 13,000 square miles of which 3,000 are inland waterways, the delta of the Maas, the Scheldt, and the mighty Rhine. Almost half the land well below sea level, defended by shallow dikes against the rivers and the sea, which time and again through the centuries attacked and flooded the land through the mouth of the rivers and a bulge in the coastline called the Cider Sea. Our windmills are really water pumps designed to drain seepage water from the polders, parcels of land reclaimed from the water and surrounded by dikes. There were some small elevated mounds and islands in what is now polderland where at the warning boom of the flood cannon the people took refuge and huddled until the flood had subsided. But time and again, up into recent years, the sea would break through with sudden fury. Aided by rain-swollen rivers, it would rip through the dikes we had built with such care, destroying homes, devastating whole villages, and forcing the inhabitants to flee for their lives. In 1891, an unknown young engineer in the water ministry proposed a plan to close the whole Cider Sea with a strong dike to keep out the floods and shorten the coastline, then to reclaim several polders from the new lake, polders separated by water to provide for transportation and drainage, and to make the rest a fresh water basin by replacing the salt water with fresh water from a branch of the Rhine. But it took many years and another great flood before the plan became reality. Cornelius Lely, its designer, was 63 and minister of water when the project was signed into law. Fourteen years later, after much delay and preparation, and three years after Lely's death, the 20-mile-long closing dike, first step of the project, was completed. The Cider Sea was now an inland lake called Iselmere. The massive dike, 300 feet thick and 22 feet above maximum sea level, ended the threat of floods for the region, but it also deprived the Cider Sea fishermen of their main source of income, the herring fishing grounds in the open North Sea. Many of the younger men left their villages to find jobs with other fisheries. Some hired out on the herring fleet that leaves the port of Skaveningen near The Hague every spring to fish in northern waters. Fishing had been their family's life for generations. It was their life too. But many others went to work for the Cider Sea Reclamation Project when it started. They would help us make new land. The dredges were already at work the first big polder, a smaller one, had been completed with the closing dike, would be 120,000 acres. We Dutch have many centuries' experience in dike building, and the methods and materials our ancestors used still serve us well. In the Biesbosch, the muddy delta land of the Rhine, where the water rises and falls with the tides, Willow and bulrush grow in abundance. A different variety of reeds is cut and collected from the banks of canals. All these are stacked 
to be used for the making of mattresses, an important part of dike work. To make a new polder, we first had to construct a dike around the planned area and then pump out the water. But as the muddy sea bottom was much too soft to hold a dike, it had to be dredged out, a long, tedious process. In the working harbor on shore, the polder boys, as the dike workers are called, were busy making willow mattresses. Simple as it may seem, this is a specialty job. Mattresses laid against the submerged side of a dike or in the shallow sea bottom offshore to prevent erosion by the currents must last for many years. The best mattress makers come from but a few villages in Holland where sons learn the art from their fathers as soon as they are old enough to work. On the dike site, the dredges were now joined by sand pumping ships. As soon as the soft mud was scooped out in one spot, the hole had to be filled with sand dredged and brought up in barges from the river estuaries to the south, where it had clogged the traffic lanes. The sandy core was then covered with a layer of heavy boulder clay, which is impervious to water, and which we found in great quantities near the northern rim of the former Cider Sea. On this hydraulic fill, as the core is called, we dumped more clay week after week slowly building it up to two narrow parallel ridges protruding just above the water line, the beginning of a new dike. In the workyards, barges were loaded with rocks, the only material we have to import from other countries, and finished brushwood mattresses slid down the ways ready to be towed to the construction site. There the infant dike had slowly grown in length and concrete slabs were rammed into ridges for added strength against pressure. Brushwood mattresses pushed against the ridges and then weighted down with heavy rocks were to protect the underwater section of the dike against erosion. Now a steady stream of sand barges filled to capacity arrived at the scene. A powerful jet of water diluted the sand, which was then pumped through suction tubes onto the dike body, the space between the ridges. Sand into the center mattresses and rocks against the sides. Slowly, a dike section took shape. When the sand fill was completed, the profile was built up with clay and then topped with dry dirt. Then the final cover, crushed rock and old brick on the slope facing the future polder land, imported granite blocks toward the sea. On the top, burnt brick for a surface road. This is how the encircling dike was completed. Foot by foot, section after section, more than 40 miles of it. It had taken four years. It would take two more to drain the polder. The emerging land, seeded with marine grasses to speed up the drying, was soon populated with great flocks of water birds who darkened the sky with their flights. Then came the war.
its wake, it left cities and villages reduced to rubble. Great bridges collapsed in the rivers. Much of the land flooded, especially in the south. Dikes had been blown up by friend and foe alike, by the enemy to deny us the use of our land, by our allies to stop the invader. There was much destruction, but there was no despair. We set out to salvage what was possible and carried on as best we could through the difficult years of recovery. Luckily, most of the Cider Sea works had escaped destruction. Pumping on a reduced scale had quietly been continued, and the big new polder had fallen dry. In two more years, it would be under cultivation. It was time for us engineers to move on with our plans. From the houseboats we lived in with our families, we could see the long lines of brushwood stacks against the horizon. On the new polder, to be still larger than the previous one, we planned to build a city named Lelystad, or Lely City, in honor of the originator of the project. After plotting and mapping the new polder in detail, with drainage ditches, canals, and pump works, we had staked it out in the shallow sea. We took a final position reading on the lighthouse of Erk. on the town of Marken, and on Enkhuizen. In the great choppy waters, we drove down the last stake for the future location of Lelystad. Then came again the many months of dredging, and sand pumping, and the dumping of clay, and more boulder clay, until it no longer disappeared with a splash in the water, but rose above the surface, a small mound of wet mud, starting point for a 56-mile dike. How long would it take? Years had been lost to the war and to repair its damage. Now with the population on the upswing again, the need for new land was urgent. Reclamation work went ahead at full steam. Within two years, a good part of the dike had been completed. Converted houseboats and simple office structures stood on shore. And one day, without fanfare, we put up a sign. Now there was Lelystad. Lelystad grew with the dike. Soon there was a modest skyline. Our headquarters, trailers, former houseboats, dwellings of wood or brick, a small school, and a big pumping station. Drainage of the new polder was in full swing. In two or three more years, we hoped, the former sea bottom would be farmland as good or even better than that of the northeast polder, which was already in full production. Lelystad was now entered on the maps. More families had settled. On weekdays, the men worked in the water or on the dikes. On Sundays, they beautified their tiny yards or took their children fishing, a favorite pastime of most Dutch boys. <laughs> the land was at peace, but the sea did not sleep.
Early the next year, a spring tide joining forces with a heavy gale drove a solid mass of water against the Netherlands coast. The Cider Sea closing dike held, but in South Holland and Zeeland, the furious sea washed over the embankments within a few hours. The people fled, carrying with them what they could. Some tried to save their precious cattle, but the flood was too fast and most livestock had to be abandoned. The whole Cider Sea workforce and equipment was rushed south to help save the villages, but there was no hope. The dikes had burst in too many places. The entire coastal region south of Rotterdam had been lost to the sea. We threw everything we could into rescue operations. But in the first terrible night, 2,000 men, women, and children had perished. And 300,000 people had lost all they had. It was war all over again. War with our oldest enemy. Now we were resolved it must not happen again, no matter what the cost. After the worst of the damage had been repaired and the water had subsided, we set to work to seal off the whole Rhine Delta with a chain of strong dikes containing ship locks and sluices to control the river flow. This meant first constructing artificial islands in the open water beginning with enormous ring dikes and working docks, then pumping dry the inside area and packing it with sand. Concrete beams rammed into the ground would support the locks and sluices. Closing dikes would then be extended to the neighboring islands and the whole structure topped with a three-lane highway. Finally, the ring dike would be dredged away again, leaving the completed job. It was extremely difficult diking against the flow of the river and the tides of the sea. But within one year, the first embankment was up and a cement mixing plant had been moved to the base. Eighteen months later, the whole pit, a mile long and a third of a mile wide, was dry. And scores of pile drivers began their work smoking and snorting and hissing steam. 22,000 concrete piles, many 80 feet long, on this first island alone, to support 17 sluices with their steel gates and surface road on top. How long would the whole project take? Barring new disasters, perhaps 25 years. Cost? No matter. The country would be secure, and we would gain a little more land by reclamation. Once more, the Netherlands had returned to normal in the country. In the towns. Occasionally, one can observe a group of earnest-looking men on a boat ride through the canals of a polder. They are not on a pleasure cruise. They are the members of a local polder board, charged with the safety of one of the 2,800 polders which make up most of the Netherlands. They inspect the dikes regularly, their trained eyes scrutinizing every levee, bridge, or dwelling along the banks for possible weaknesses or defects due to settling of the ground. To be the head of a polder board is a position of great trust and responsibility. 
After their inspection tour, the board members assemble in the ancient Polderhuis, the headquarters building. Seated beneath the 17th century painting, depicting the session of an earlier Polder board, they discuss their own findings, as well as condition reports from citizens and dike contractors. Any correction work they deem necessary will be carried out without delay. After the end of the emergency, we of the Cider Sea Force had returned to our task. We were far behind schedule. One war and one flood behind. Dike construction for the final polders now proceeded simultaneously on different parts of the project. Simple machines now help the polder boys speed up the bundling of reeds but all the rest of mattress making had to be by hand as always. Sons worked alongside their fathers and grandfathers. And the experienced older men taught the boys how properly to make use of their muscle. This is how it has always been, from generation to generation. We had moved to a new home, another houseboat moored at Enkhuizen, north of Amsterdam. As regional project engineer, it was one of my duties to supervise the work of our contractors, the mattress making companies, the dredging outfits and surface builders, and to ensure that everything was carried out according to government plans and specifications. In more than 25 years on the project, how many thousand brushwood mattresses had I seen on their way, bobbing in the choppy waters, protected by a barge tied across the front? How many daily trips had I made in fair weather and foul to construction sites. How many thousands of tons of rocks had I watched them dump on the mattresses to place them firmly against the body of the dike. Many of the polder boys, the dike workers, I had known for a quarter of a century. Now they were graying men and their sons worked with them. They, in turn, would be middle-aged men and heads of families before the whole project was completed. On the Lelystad side, 20 miles of embankment are now almost finished. With the use of some newer surface covering materials, such as bituminous bricks, work can proceed more rapidly. As soon as the dike road is paved and the inlet channel bridged, there will be a direct link between Lelystad and Amsterdam. First part of a highway net that will cover a whole new province of the Netherlands wrested from the sea. And Lelystad will be its capital. New Lelystad, that is, under construction a little farther inland where there is more room to expand to 20,000, later to 100,000, a planned, spacious city like Emmelord in the northeast polder. The Netherlands are crowded. Many thousands have returned from former colonies. The population, already nearly 1,000 to the square mile, is increasing rapidly. In the old land, cities are reaching the limits of their growth, competing for space with industry. In the new land, they can be planned for future needs with industrial parks and residential districts far enough apart laid out around a civic center. Cities supported by half a million acres of rich new polder land. Our own land instead of colonies. Land we have made from the sea. We Dutch love the outdoors on Sundays, you'll find us on the road, on scooters, 
bikes, on foot, exploring our country, remembering its past, enjoying its hard-won beauty. Some people say, in time, the sea will take it all again. They warn us that the polar ice is melting, the North Sea level slowly rising, the shelf on which we live subsiding. No matter, we have no fear. The founder of this country, when he went to battle for independence from Spain, once said, you need not have success when trying, or any hope to make a start. On the southern end of the closing dike, near the working port, we have set a modest monument to Cornelius Lely. In our little museum in Lelystad, beneath the royal emblem, is an inscription which reads, In this new land the ground is laid for healthy future generations. <laughs> 